What's going on, everybody? It is your boy, Dylan Matthews, alongside the man, the myth, the legend himself, Bo Morgan, and we are Peachtree Football. Make sure you like Peachtree Football, download Peachtree Football, subscribe to Peachtree Football. We are wherever you get your podcast. That is Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Odyssey app, wherever you get your podcast, Peachtree Football is there. I got Bo Squid Billy Morgan with me. He was actually, it, it, we got a lot of catching up to do, Bo, at least. Well, we don't necessarily, but the people have a lot of catching up to do with you because the last time we were doing Peace Street football, Mike Johnson was filling in for you because you were on your birthday week vacation. So first of all, welcome to the, uh, well, I don't know if I can welcome you to the to the 40 Club because, you know, I'm not, I'm not there yet. So, but happy belated birthday to you. And I'm saying that for uh, all my Peachtree footballers out there. So it was Bo's birthday. So make sure you all wish uh, Bo happy belated birthday in the comments. But uh, real quick, man, since they haven't had a chance to uh, hear about what you did uh, during your birthday, man, if you real quick just want to touch on that, tell us about it. Well, you said real quick three times. Do you want me to touch on it or not? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, man, we went to uh, me and um, the wife and about eight. Well, no, they're not about eight. Eight of our neighbors, um, so four other couples, went down to Cancun to an all-inclusive down there. Uh, we got a good deal months and months ago and um, and decided to jump on it and um we had some people want to jump in too so we went down there and went six days and um just sat back and you know had some some cold drinks by the infinity pool that yeah. basically looked out over the ocean and uh we'll get yeah. it done. it was a lot of fun um it was good i wouldn't say that i was um i don't want to use the word rested but i'm definitely re-energize and recharge the mental battery um because a lot of times when you go on vacation you need to come home and have a vacation from the vacation but yeah <laughs> good time um and would recommend it for anybody um uh, my my vacations are odd because i can't take anything once basically in 16 days i will not be able to take any time off so a day Ooh. here, a day there, and you're mm -hmm. the same way. Yep. Because both of us work on Atlanta Falcons Radio Network. That's why we do Peace Free Football, which is exclusive about the Falcons. But, yeah, man, we're here. It was a good time. I'm, I'm really glad uh, to do it. It was my second time in Cancun, first time at that resort. And um, and beautiful time, beautiful place. Uh, appreciate all the people that went and the birthday wishes. And now – Honestly, it was football season, so time to roll. lock in. I don't want to sound like Russell Wilson, but let's ride. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully we don't uh, – the Falcons, I should say, don't have the season the uh, the Denver Broncos had last season. Hopefully that's not the type of season they're having this year. But talking about the Atlanta Falcons, training camp, like you said, right around the corner, we're getting ready to lock in. I mean, like we said, it, it's just about full steam ahead, 16 days, I believe, until training camp. And I mean, it, it's right there, Bo. So r real quick, what is your favorite part of training camp? As someone that works on the Atlanta Falcons radio network has been covering the Falcons for what? Almost. Uh, it's been over a decade now for you. You've been you've been covering the Falcons, right? Or I mean, I've been covering them for um, since 2008. I've been. Yeah. yeah. I, my first year following the team in the regular season was 2009 and my first year traveling with the team was 2012. So, um, yeah, I put some time in, honestly, my favorite thing about training camp has nothing to do. My, my number one favorite thing has nothing to do with football. Mm -hmm. Um, and my second favorite thing to do has everything to do with football. <laughs> um, but my first, my number one favorite thing is I get a chance my best friend from college lives uh, about 10 minutes from the Falcons facility. Mm -hmm. And so during training camp, uh, I'm always doing radio shows up there, uh, as you know. And it's it's about an hour and 10 minute drive back and forth for me to Flowery Branch one way. Um, 
And so it's not a fun trip to make. So I go there and stay with him and his beautiful family. He nice. has two daughters and I'm Uncle Bo for the week. <laughs> and I get to see them and spend time with them and him. So um, that's my favorite thing about training camp. I know it sounds weird and it's off the path, but that is a person that's no, very that's close awesome. to me. Uh, I was really good friends with he and his wife in college. And um, and they got two, two awesome kids. And it's fun to hang out with them and see them and catch up and get to, um, you know, really um, – you know, reconnect with people that are close to me. So it's all, it's a lot of work because you're standing out there at practice, you know, in the past I've been doing that. I've done mornings and afternoons. I'm back on mornings, but in the past I would go to the gym first thing in the morning and then go to training camp, watch practice, do interviews, go home, shower, get the interviews sent out or go to his house. And then we would do a show from, um, last few years. It was the Hooters. Yeah. And, and Buford, and um, the year before that, it was um, it was um, a place called the Thirsty Turtle, and which was a place <laughs> there. So those were always fun being around the crowds up there. But the the, the real favorite thing, the football, the thing that people really want to hear about, my favorite thing, is those first few weeks, or I, I wouldn't even say the first few days, but that first padded practice or two, and just watching the guys. And there's there's position position drills that the guys do um primarily um trench play right Uh i really love watching the offensive lineman go against the d lineman and that drill is always fun to me and then the other one or wide receivers and db drills where you're seeing skill position go uh on top of each other and seeing who how those go those are the most fun to me but i love seeing those the big uglies go at each other um, and seeing how that plays out, because I think it can set a tone um, for the season and for position battles that are set to happen during the season. And you just said the key word, Bo Morgan, position battles. And we've been going through them all off season long, and we're going to continue that today with the running backs. Now, you think you're running backs? We know who the running backs are going to be. Yes, we do. Tyler Algier. B. John Robinson, Cordell Patterson is going to get a little play there as well. It's not a matter of who's going to be back there. I want to know from you, Bo Morgan, what your perspective and what your take is on how exactly do you think these, and again, it's going to, all of this is going to be hard to tell. And obviously this is all speculation up until we get into the season and we start seeing a little bit during training camp, preseason, things of that nature. However, I do want to discuss how might we predict Arthur Smith divvies up the carries between a B. John Robinson, a Tyler Algier, and a Cordell Patterson. Now, we've talked about this before. We both believe Cordell Patterson will be more involved in the passing game, so probably won't expect quite as many carries, definitely not as many carries as we saw maybe last year. So, don't want to necessarily put a number on it, but if you had to go percentage wise, how would you divvy up the percentages between Bijan, Tyler Algier, Cordell Patterson when you talk about uh who gets who gets uh, as many carries? Um in the regular season, I, I don't I don't know how to answer that because I don't think there's an answer. Mm-hmm. I, I think you've got three running backs that do three different things. Okay. Um, I would tell you that two of them do a lot of the same things, and Bijan and Cordero Patterson. Mm, okay. Cordero Patterson will definitely be returning kickoffs. Yeah. I'm curious if they think that they'll have to have him do punts with um, Avery Williams' absence. I would say no. I don't think they want that. I think they want him healthy. Yeah. Because you never, and I think they don't want to put too much on him being an older player. Um, but look. There's a truth to feeding the hot hand. There is also a truth to there's also a truth to um certain guys do certain things. And yeah. Tyler Algier is a guy who is a more of a I mean, I'm not trying to B. John Robinson breaks tackles, but Algier is gonna be your battering ram, I would oh, say. Yeah. Wrecking he, ball. He, 
See, the problem with me is, is Algier is really good at the backfield receiving a lot better than people realize. Yeah. Um, sure. Bijan's better, though. Yeah. Well, Daryl is better. Yeah. They're both better route runners, they both have better hands. So I, I think that there's, they're going to, that Arthur is going to try to keep people off balance. But there's going to be truth as well. And I'm not trying to talk in circles, but there's going to be no. truth to feeding the hot hand. Yeah. And, and, you do want to share carries, though, where you keep these guys fresh. I also right. don't think that every game they're going to go run it as much as they did last year. Yeah. So you could see Algier and, and Bijan have um, close to the same amount of touches in different ways. And it's very important to 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 not get upset if 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 the if the Saints game um, no, excuse me, the Panthers game to open the season. I don't know why I keep thinking they're opening with the Saints, but if the Panthers <laughs> game to start the season is maybe a tighter defensive battle than we realize because I know they have a good defense, mm -hmm. um, especially a front four or five, six guys that are very good players, and it turns into a battle, you know, some kind of 13-10 game, and they run the ball more. And Algier gets more carries and more touches than Bijan. I don't want people to freak out. I also think there could be games where Bijan gets, you know, uh, as much as five to six touches, seven touches more than, than Algier. It's going to be a balance, and it's going to be based on keeping guys fresh and a hot hand. Yeah. And it, it to me to say, I just can't sit here and tell you I know a number because I haven't seen Bijan carry a football yet right. at all it, it, with, yeah. with pads on. Um in any meaningful snap, not even in a preseason snap, which is not meaningful. So <laughs> it, it, it's going to – how good is Bijan in pass protection when push comes to shove? So That's true. there's just so much to go. Mm. But I, I honestly feel like um, unless an Algier or a Patterson or, God forbid, a Bijan Robinson goes down, I think that there's going to be a plan to split between these guys, to keep guys fresh, and to go with a hot hand based on not only the game plan but how the game was playing out. No, I completely agree. Like like you said, a big thing about this is going to be rhythm too, uh, and that ties into that's the same thing as keeping the hot hand. You know, if, if guys start to feel a certain groove, then Arthur Smith may ride them for uh, a, few, uh, a few carries longer than maybe what he usually does. And like you said, if it was a short yardage situation, depending on what what the defense is, what that defense does well, maybe we see Tyler Algier come in there and get a tough yard, or maybe we see Bijan sneak out of the backfield and he he leaks out and that and they get the the yard that way. It, it all just depends on situations, and it all just depends on the personnel, of the defense, what you have on the offense, what's been working, what the defense, what adjustments has the defense made so far in, in in game, what the defense is trying to take away. I mean, there, like you said, there are just so many things that go into where you're going to have somebody, what position you're going to put somebody in. So it, it is going to be very interesting to see, and, and it just goes back to a theme that we've been talking about all offseason, the versatility that this offense is going to have. So that leads me into my, my next topic, Bo. And this is something I think is very interesting. You can make an argument for both sides, but I've picked my side, and I want to see what side you are on. Which side of the ball has more pressure? to perform offense or defense. Now there's a couple of ways you can go here. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to make my case first and I'm, and I'm interested to see which side you're on. I think it's the offense. Why? One, your head coach is offensive minded. He is a great offensive mind. He is what people are calling offensive guru. He's drawing the plays. He's calling the plays. With that being said, all the guys they've drafted on the offensive side of the ball, obviously the past three picks they've used on skill position players, B.J. Robinson this year, Drake London in 2021, Kyle Pitts in 2020. So that's a lot of draft capital you have invested on the offensive side of the ball. The other thing about it is, too, obviously just, just the amount of pressure Desmond Ritter has on him to perform this year. I mean, that could honestly seal it alone. But the amount of there is also uh, there is also questions about Kyle Pitts. Now, I don't think 
there should be any worries about Kyle Pitts, but there have been questions about Kyle Pitts. Is he going to be able to have a, a bounce back year coming off the injury? Is he going to be able to, you know, have more of a season like his rookie season, maybe with more touchdowns than he was last year. Now, and last year he was hurt. So, you know, you have to give him a little bit of a pass there, but those have those, those rumblings have been out there, you know? So I think there's a lot more pressure on the offense. And the thing, other thing about it too, with, investing the the draft stock that you have in the offensive side of the football the uh, you know we we talked about this uh before a while back ago you know they did spend a lot of money on the defensive side of the ball yes you 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 got it you you spent a lot of money when you talk about free agent uh free agent dollars you did invest a lot on the defensive side of the ball in free agency yes but and i'm not saying they missed by any stretch of me so let me be clear i'm not saying they missed on anybody offensively but it's important to make sure you're hitting on draft picks. We know how you can get set back if you miss on draft picks and first round picks to uh, to especially to that point. So, I mean, just to give you an example, we've we've struggled as a as a pass rushing team because we have we've just straight up missed on on, on some pass rushers and not this regime. I'm not putting on this regime. The last regime, you know, they drafted Tack McKinley. Where is he now? He's not on the roster. Vic Beasley. He he did have a good season. He did have one good season. And, you know, the, his, his contract year wasn't terrible, but where is he now? He's not on the roster. And if you ask Falcons fans, they probably call Tack McKinley a miss. They probably call Vic Beasley a miss. So we know how important it is if you miss on guys. So you can't afford to have any of the guys. And again, I'm not saying that they did miss on any of these guys because obviously they have their whole careers ahead of them. But you can't afford to miss on high draft picks, obviously. You can't afford to miss really on any first-round draft picks, period. So without all those reasons being said, I think there is more pressure on the offensive side of the football to, to perform this year. Well, I would say... I, I could go either way. Um, I would agree with you that when you have three first round draft picks and in, in three consecutive years under the brand under this new regime, then there is pressure to score points. Problem is the offense was one of the best rushing was the, the top three, uh, maybe the yeah. second best rushing offense in the league last year. Right. And um, and they only look to get better. Um, they ran, right. they faced more stacked boxes than any other offense in the league last year and produced better than any other team in the league last year. Right. So it's easy to say there, but I would go ahead and look at the fact that all the positional spending other than Johnu Smith from this roster and re-signing, you know, the guys that you needed, like extending Chris Lindstrom and re-signing Caleb McGarry, which is keeping sure. your own, but all the guys you brought in from David Anyamata and Calais Campbell and, uh, Kendall uh, Ellis and um, Jesse Beta um, and Mike Hughes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you the, the, you can go a uh, Jesse Bates, who was the yep. biggest, highest price free agent, and yep. then you brought in a new DC and Ryan Nielsen. You know, those were all all your money from outside was, was spent. spent. On, so Johnny Smith was a yep. trade, but all the money on the outside that spent came on defense. that came to the defense. So. Yep. You spent a lot of free cap space on defense. You went out and got the the best secondary player available on defense in Jesse Bates. You improved this defense at every level, seemingly. And and you did it on based on a guy in Ryan Nielsen and, and what he wants to do with the defense and where it differs from Dean P. So you can we can talk about the cheaper players with draft draft capital spent, but price tag wise. That's fine. We've seen the offense perform with lesser talent because of the coach. So I would, I would have to. Say, I'm not saying I disagree with you about the offense because yeah. I think when you spend draft capital like that with players like Jalen Carter on the board, mm -hmm. then you've you've got to perform. But right. on the other side, they signed a lot of. If they tied up a lot of money. And what will look, what are supposed to be impact players, um, 
So defense is the one that's got to improve. You lost games last year not because you couldn't control the football because you could or score points because you did, not as great as you wanted to. But you shortened games with how you played because your defense was flawed. And you you need the defense to be better to open the offense up to use B. John Robinson at, at, at what his best skill set, to use Drake London and Kyle Pitts. You know, Desmond Ritter's not going to get a chance to do the things that people want to see from him if this um this defense is allowing points every time. And every time they get the ball, they're shredded and they go down the field because now you have to play a certain style of offense to cut the game shorter and try to control that to keep your defense in limited possessions because you don't trust them. And they can't get after the, the the quarterback and all those things. And I think that was an extent last year. That is something that 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 happened based on the the personnel that the defense had, or lack of personnel, lack of talent on that side, especially at times when you did not have anybody in that secondary that you honestly trusted because AJ Terrell and um, Casey Hayward are both who's gone now, but we're both yep. off the field. And yep. you've got the Cornell Armstrongs. No offense. No, nope. but, but but you've got um, those type, you know, the uh, the young players like, um, J, you know, Isaiah Oliver is gone, but D. Alford and Cornell Armstrong and Darren Hall yep. are, are your three cornerbacks on the field because you're a nickel. So that's the situation where, you know, we can say the offense, but honestly, the defense is under just as much pressure, including the new D.C. and Ryan Nielsen. So, um, I understand the offense, and I don't disagree, yeah. but I can make yeah. an argument just as big of an argument for the defense being under just as much pressure. You absolutely can, and I think that's why it's such an interesting conversation. And it brings me to this question. So I talked about how hard it can be to bounce back from missing on, on draft picks, whether the first-round draft pick, second-round, whatever. If, if you if you miss in the draft – it is hard to bounce back from. And the and again, I, I touched on the Falcons have kind of gone through that themselves in, in, in certain years. But you could say the same thing for bad free agent signings. Hard to bounce back from, from that as well. Which one would you say it, it, it is harder to bounce back from? Is it harder to kind of work around missed draft picks or is it harder to work around miss miss free agent signings? Uh Hell, that's a. <laughs> I that's mean, it's, not, kind of, it's almost one of the same, but. Well, look, it's not any. It's not a. I feel like I'm trying. I feel like I'm tr coming off like smartest guy in the room, or trying to, and I'm not trying to. Let me explain no. something. It depends on where you're at. Mm -hmm. The Falcons are going to have a ton of money next year. Yeah. Um, and. So if they miss on a Jesse Bates or an Anya Mata this year, it's okay. It all depends on the guaranteed money that is put out there. But right. let me say something. When what what killed the Falcons um, at the end of the Thomas Dimitrov era were they re-signed their own, which was the right thing to do. But when you re-sign your own – and they're contributing, you're you're basically taking money and you're signing players long term. So your 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 cap space is going down, especially when you have a franchise quarterback making franchise quarterback money, which right. they did. So the quarterback money, that kind of really changes the game. Right. With, with, with a Desmond Ritter right now and the money he's making, or if they had a rookie quarterback, yeah, you could miss on some free agents. But when you get a franchise quarterback and you're paying him that, now you're in a position where you can't miss on draft picks. And the reason is because you build your team through the draft and then you resign your own and you sprinkle in veteran players, right? Right. Right. So the Falcons the made a conscious decision to to build through free agency on the defense. 
Right. And to build through the draft on the offense. Correct. Um, you just can't afford to be paying players top level money and miss on the draft. Mm. Um, so to me, you can, the missing on the draft is what really hamstrings franchises, especially once the, the, the worm turns and right. you start, does that, it? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, it makes sense and answers the question. So to me, the draft is the way to not only restock, but to build some key pieces. Correct. Um, and you can always sprinkle in free agents, right? Right. Um, but when you when you start winning and you get to the place that the Falcons were in the 16 and 17 seasons, to answer your question, that version of the Falcons couldn't miss on draft picks like they did with Tack McKinley. Right, right. Um, like they did with some offensive linemen. Everyone always says the Julio Jones trade crippled this team. No. It didn't. No. What I will tell you is, because they say, well, look at all the draft capital you traded. And that's true. You traded a lot of draft capital. What right. crippled the team was missing on Peter Kahn's the next uh the next year and missing on Lamar Holmes the next year and then you missed on trench players that you needed to build the core of the team the trenches up so th the draft to me is how you build a team um i've always said you build a team through the draft and then through sprinkling in free agents while keeping your own Right. When you get to a certain level, your team's already built, you're maintaining. You can't miss on draft picks because that's the way you restock players re and continue to keep your team intact. You get contract yeah. friendly uh, players who are Correct. starters in the first, second, and third round. So uh, I would say that to me, the draft, you don't want to overpay someone else's use goods right if they're not quality um and that's what free agency is that's why i think you saw this team go through free agency the way they did um last uh last or this offseason where they didn't really only sign one guy to a really big contract not right. named chris lindstrom and that was an extension but the draft man is very important it's yeah very important and you gave and you gave the perfect example, honestly, with the 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 sixteen seventeen team. That again, it had their kind of cornerstone pieces set, and they couldn't miss in the draft because they had a lot of money allocated at that point to Matt Ryan. They had a lot of money allocated at that point to Julio Jones and guys of that nature. So, like you said, at, at that point in, in in where the Atlanta Falcons were, because it goes back to where you're saying it depends on where they are. Where they were at that point in time, they didn't necessarily have the uh, a lot of money to supplement the team with free agents. So they had so the it made the draft picks that much more important, and that's why it was. And that's why, like you said, it really hamstringed them when they were missing on draft picks at that point in time. Because at that point in time, that was a the, one of the most key times you couldn't be uh, missing on draft picks. So no, that was that was a that was a perfect example. But I agree. Look, you can. For where the Falcons are now, it really could go either way because it, it really is two sides of it. It's really a two-sided coin. You have a lot invested draft stock-wise on, on the offensive side. And on the defensive side, you have a lot of money, a lot of free agent dollars invested on the defensive side of the football. So, you, like I said, you can really make argument for both. And uh, I think we did a good job of, of doing that. And that's why the I think the conversation is so interesting. But I think we won't have to worry about it either way because I think both sides will perform and I think we are set to have a very, very fun and a very good year for the Atlanta Falcons. So that is going to do it for this episode of Peachtree Football. Make sure you like this podcast, download the podcast, subscribe to Peachtree Football as well. We are wherever you get your podcast. That is Apple Podcasts. That is Spotify. That is the Odyssey app. Wherever you get your podcast, Peachtree Football is there we are getting closer and closer to training camp we got what one two more episodes before we really start digging our teeth into what's going down in training camp so it's getting closer and it's really just a downhill sprint from there so for 
Bo, Squid Billy Morgan, I am Dylan Matthews. And until we talk to you guys next week, peace.